that you've got to follow your dream. Your dream is just behind a door. Now, I don't know where that door is for you. It could be a mile away, it could be 10 miles away. It could be a big bulky door. It could be a tiny door that you have to squeeze through. I don't know what the situation is with that, but it is on the other side of that door. You owe it to yourself. You only live once. It's not a rehearsal. You got to go find it and break it down because what you want is on the other side of that door and you've got to believe in yourself and do it. Shall we go? <laughs> This is exciting, right? This is this very is, exciting. Like I said, this is so surreal in a way because I'm usually, I've done 14 episodes where I'm the guy asking the questions. And I think now, you're already doing it again. <laughs> I actually wanted to ask you about your voice, actually. My voice? Because you have a wonderful speaking voice. Like and I just wondered where that came from. Is it is it uh, is it just natural? Or it's is natural. It, it's natural. Okay. And I've been told as well it's a little bit lower than most girls, which is a good thing. Yeah. It's not very like much. high pitched and because otherwise it gets girls. a bit uh, shrill in a way. But you haven't got that quality at all. It's very cool. This guy's good. This guy's good. But today, Leo Taylor Genati. 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 Or Genati. Genati. Whichever you prefer. The Ura uh, Well, we'll we'll go uh, on. The Iranian. To this, that the Iranian pronunciation, I believe, is Genati. Okay. But I say Genati just because I, 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 if I say Genati, I sound very northern. So <laughs> Which you I are, try. But... I am northern, but I'm kind of a little bit trying to hide that a little bit. Oh uh, no! No. I shouldn't do, should I? No, I, should I talk as broad as I possibly can. My family are from Blackpool, and I'm very proud about it. Not sure I should be about the Blackpool, but but uh, but this is living in the hyphen podcast. Yes, it is. Yep. And today we are going to be talking about you. You are in the spotlight. Like you said, you're usually this side interviewing people, but I, Hannah, I'm going to be interviewing you. Now we met very recently on a conference, hit it off, and I'm very glad to be sitting here yes. now talking to you. And I thought you'd be perfect, actually. A perfect balance, because I'm kind of like chilled and slow and <laughs> a little, coming across maybe a little bit stoned. But whereas you're like full of energy, full of Red Bull, and you're, and Tenzing, Tenzing actually. There are other energy there drinks. There are other energy drinks out there. <laughs> but this is to give your wonderful audience a little bit more background information about you, you know, what you've been through in your life so far, so far. what's to come. Mm -hmm. uh, so very intrigued to find out a bit more. And I know you gave me a few little uh, jumping boards to go with. So, but first of all, I want to ask you, obviously we're here for the podcast. Where did the inspiration come from? Because I did write down what you say on your website, and I love this. So this is in an age where everyone is meant to fit into a specific box. The Living in the Hyphen podcast is an exploration of what it means to be living between two worlds, embracing being an outsider and being a hybrid person. Yes. I love this. So, yeah, inspiration for this. Well, I was working with a producer last year. I did a course with him, a guy called Alex LeMay, so I'll give him a bit of a shout out. And one of the things that I took away from that course was, if you want to be a producer, produce something. Mm -hmm. What could I produce? And I think you've got to make the best with what you have. Mm -hmm. And a podcast is not too expensive to produce. So that was why I chose a podcast. I also thought it was a great way of creating a lot of content because you can have an hour episode, split it up into lots of different videos and put them on YouTube, social media and such. In terms of living in the hyphen, I just felt for most of my life, and hopefully we'll talk about this, a big part of it has been my identity and feeling a little bit like an outsider. I think that's why I kind of went down the acting route in a, in a sense, trying to find who I am through the performance and get in touch with who I really am. And identity in today's day and age, I think like, like, you, like you read from, from my post that you can get pigeonholed. And I think the society at the moment wants to put people in boxes mm. And some people just don't fit in boxes. They just don't, it doesn't work like that for most people. We all have our own little individual boxes. Exactly, we are all our own niche, I think. Well, absolutely, and I, mean, I was gonna say, you know, you do a lot of other things, you know, you like you're in, oh dear. First rule of a podcast, don't tap the don't mic. Don't touch the don't mic. Don't touch the mic. Uh, but you're an actor, writer, producer. You've got uh, Xanadu Media. Um, you also have like a camera charisma course, which I love the title of Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. You know, sponsor-wise as well. So many things going on. So many things. All this just to pay the bills at the end of the day. <laughs> London is an expensive city. Yeah, it is. Yeah, if you want to go for a drink, you need to earn that cash, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, well, we will come on to that a little bit later. So why don't we start at the very beginning? The beginning. The, the very the beginning. beginning. The early life of Leo. And like you said, you're a northern boy. You're a northern boy at heart. Yeah. Um, you were brought up in Bolton. So what was That's that like? That's right. I grew up in Bolton in the 90s. Uh, I grew up in a village just outside of Bolton. 
And it was, I would say 98, 99% white. And my father was Iranian. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that there was uh, racism or anything like that, but there was a little bit of ignorance around at the time. It was a bit of an unusual thing mm. to have a foreigner with a local girl. And I think myself and my sister did feel a little bit like outsiders. I don't think we ever felt really any real racism, mm -hmm. but we definitely felt a little bit like we were a bit othered in a way. Okay. Um, and for the most part, it was, it was a happy childhood. Uh, my mother and father had quite a toxic relationship and that created a little bit of emotional stress for myself and my sister. And it was at times quite hard when they would be, because they, they were never married and they would, and my dad actually didn't live with us. He lived in London and we would see him every now and then, like every month, two or three weeks, maybe sometimes a bit longer than that. Were, were your parents ever together? Like did they ever? <sighs> you, what would t typically happen is my dad would come home. They would, my dad would usually give my mum some money and then the relationship would be nice. And then something would happen. There'd be a huge argument, da 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 da, da and then they kind of split up in a sense. Okay. Even though, they were, you know, in a month's time he would be back. But as a child, seeing that again and again and again, it, it was it was quite hard. And you, um, are you close to them now? I'm close with my father now. I actually live with my father. Oh, right. I actually think I might do a podcast with him, potentially. Oh, you absolutely should. <laughs> that would be brilliant. Yeah, my Iranian dad. I'm thinking, yeah. I think because he says some, he's quite an interesting character. He's quite a weird character, actually. But it'd be um, interesting to find out on, you know, I I'm, I'm, don't know what your relationship is, if, if you're very open with him, but finding out about some things from his point of view, like those moments where you said, yeah, every month I'd come up and see you and I did, that'd be very interesting. I think people would be interested to hear about that because, you know, it's incredibly common to come from, you know, like a childhood where parents aren't together or there's been arguments mm -hmm. and it does have quite an effect, I think, you know, on a, on a sliding scale, obviously. But, you know, you see an argument from your parents, it's going to have a... I think it was very... Big... Thinking back, it was very tough on my mother in particular mm. because she had got into a relationship with my father. They have nothing in common. But she got into a relationship with him thinking that he would be a breadwinner. And How did they kind meet? Of support. They met, he... Uh, she was working at a casino and he was gambling ah, at the okay. casino. Mm -hmm. He's also a massive gambler. So the money would be sometimes growing up, up and down, up and down. Okay. Sometimes we had loads of money and sometimes we had nothing. Mm. And it was very unstable. And most of the arguments I think did stem from that. It was far, all about money. And that's why I, I kind of am a little bit, not obsessed with money, but I, I'm always got it in the back of my mind. I need to have some financial base Otherwise, because that's kind of what we, what I came from. It was very unstable. And my mother, I think in some ways she was quite trapped actually, because my father would never allow another man to come into the, into the home. Never, ever, ever. So she was kind of stuck with two kids, not really having any money herself. She had like part-time jobs and um, low paid jobs. So I think she felt a little bit trapped and that was yeah. very stressful for her. And then that came, that rubbed off on, yeah, of course. on, on the kids. And it was, it was quite hard at times. There was a period when it was actually very, very difficult, very depressing to just be a kid in that house. It was because my mother, she has a, an ability. I don't even know if she, if she knows this, but if she's in a good mood, she can lift the whole room. Right. But if she's in a bad mood, you know, it was pretty, pretty, a cloud would just, cover everything and being young kids yeah you kind of blame it on yourself you know you think it's to do with you and that i think might be a little bit of root of why i'm so ambitious today you know kind of trying to prove this is why i existed <laughs> you know this is why uh, i was uh i was born but yeah that's i don't think that's again an uncommon feeling to have from an upbringing like that i think you know little things i <laughs> that's why i think it's it's a lot of pressure to be a parent because I mean, you can't analyze it too much because you go mad, but you know, little things that you do, your kids will, you don't know yeah. what it is, but the, you know, the, I, things that I think about, I'm like, I bet mum and dad don't know that I, I picked that up or I thought about that, but it's very powerful what they can do. Yeah, very powerful. Yeah. And I think you are always gonna kind of mess your kids up, <laughs> whatever happens. It's just how much. <laughs> it's just how much, yeah. 
So you just try and keep it to a minimum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hope yeah. for the best, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, another important figure in your life was your grandfather, wasn't yes, it? Yes, that's true. I think... Is that your mum's dad? My mum's dad. Yeah. So my father was very distant when I was a young child. I don't think he was particularly ready for kids. And that's when my grandfather kind of became my father figure mm -hmm. during those years. And I remember going to museums with him a lot. And he could talk like no one could talk. I mean, he was an amazing orator. And I would just sit and just be completely captive audience for him. And I think he loved that, mm. you know. And I loved listening to his stories and everything. And I think retrospectively, he was an incredibly charismatic man. And as a child, I was actually very shy, very introverted. And I think now, as I'm older, I, I really try and lean into being charismatic, being an orator, being a good speaker. I think a little bit influenced by him actually, Aww. trying to emulate him in some way. Yeah, is he still with us? Do you no, he, he, he was very, I mean, he lived to be 90 years old. Okay. So he had good innings. Uh, he died, I think six years ago. Oh, wow, well, okay, we well, were still quite an important part of your life until Yeah, you even in your... my mid twenties, mm. I, still, I still knew him. Um, he saw me set up my first business, which was nice. And um, yeah, he, he had a great life and he was very proud of me in the end. He was just he was just ninety years old. I mean, he was yeah. he was knackered at really the end of the day, you know, nineties. It's all that storytelling. All that storytelling, <laughs> tying him out, yeah, and taking me to the museum. Um, okay, so moving into your your teenage years, yes. you a bit of a rebellious teenager. Well, I'd love you know? to sound it would sound, it'd sound quite sexy, wouldn't it, if I was saying, yeah, I was a bad lad. And I all that. wasn't. I wasn't a rebellious teenager. <laughs> I, mean, I know what you mean. It doesn't sound sexy, but at the same time, I'm like, well, I didn't feel like I had too much to rebel against. Yeah, well, I mean, I was one of those, I was class clown. I was always taking the mick out of the teachers, <laughs> taking the mick out of people, doing silly stuff. But I used to get away with it because I was quite bright. Mm. And I was the kind of guy that would turn up for exams, not hadn't revised, have a look, Ugh. little look, and then get a B. And it'd be like, oh, he's got a B. That's so unfair. It's not fair. Yeah, and uh, particularly, English and drama, I was just very, very just good. Mm. My only, I think, natural talent, really, written verbal communication. And that I didn't even have to, I really, I didn't have to do anything, really. I just turned up, did the essay, A star. Wow. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> Whereas some of us, <laughs> well, some of us had but, to work a little harder. <laughs> but the, what happened was, it got me quite complacent. Mm. And my biggest regret is my education, because what happened was from the school's perspective, they were saying like, this guy's getting like B's and C's. So without, so there's no problem here, right? Mm. And he got an A star in English, he got an A star in drama, perfect. It's the middle -y ones that always get lost, don't they, in their educational exactly. system? Exactly. And I kind of felt, and you know, if I'd been pushed, I remember a teacher, I, I, I got my, it, my school was all about five A to C's. That's all they cared about. Kids getting five A to C grades. Okay. That's all they cared about because that meant they could go to college or go to, we didn't have a sixth form, we had to go to college. Mm -hmm. And I remember I got my five A to C's in year nine. So I had two years to just. Oh, you can bank them? I just banked them, yeah. What? Yeah. Oh, wow, okay. I was just like, then I had two years just Dumb. sort of, yeah, just sort of floating around, taking the piss out not of teachers pushing you, yeah. and not pushing myself at all. And I remember. Not your fault. Well, I, you can play the blame game, but I remember there was a, a, a teacher, he said to me, you weren't at your English literature exam this afternoon, Leo. I said, oh, don't worry, sir, I got a B on it. I got a B on it in year nine. And he said, I never forget his response. Why didn't you try to get a better grade? Now, if he'd have said you could get a better grade, I would have said, yeah, I probably could. Oh, it's but the because disappointment he asked me why, thing. and because he was disappointed, yeah, I was like, I don't have an answer for that, you know? But say la vie. I then went to college and college was a tough time. It was for the first time I had to dress in normal clothes, which for me, I felt very naked. So what, you were always in a uniform before? Yeah, that. in a uniform before. College, we had to dress in normal clothes. So I felt a little bit of, cause I didn't really have any nice clothes. I basically used to wear football tops. This is why, I, th no, but this is why I think the uniform thing is not always the worst idea because it just puts everyone on the same level pegging field. No one's, oh, you wore that and aren't you fashionable? It's like, uh, we're all in, in yeah. saying. So I think I, yeah, yeah I get that. Yeah, I, I get that as well. And I, I, you know, I went to college, it was tough. I mean, 
the first year I did quite well. And then the second year I didn't do too well. And that was a little bit because I just went a little bit off the rails. I was very emotional at that age, 16, 17. You know, I was trying desperately to get a girlfriend. You have no idea. You know, I just really wanted just a sort of love and affection really. Um, but you feel like you weren't getting that at home. Is that why you were? That, I kind of can't really remember much of that. But yeah, that probably did have a part of it. Mm. I mean, not that they weren't, you know, my mother and father loved me, but their relationship was probably the, at the, the worst that it had been at that time. And they were basically counting down the clock until both my sister and I turned 18 and then they were gonna cut off completely. Right. That was sort of the feeling anyway. And you can feel that, can't you? And you, you can yeah. feel that, yeah. And it was hard. I mean, I had uh, my university choices were all A's, and I think the lowest one was ABB. Wow, and what were you looking to study? I was looking to study drama. Okay. I did want to study drama. And I, drama and film studies. So King's College was one, uh, Queen Mary, which is the one I wanted to go to. But unfortunately in the A2, I just I just didn't, didn't perform at all. Um, I think this is, um this is the thing when, like you said, when you're naturally very intelligent, whatever that means really, but um, you've been very used to getting good grades. And then like the higher up you get, the more you do have to actually do some work. And yeah. I think, you know, the, the clever kids um, struggle a little bit because they've never had to do it. Whereas maybe, you know, the kids who have had to really work in the past, they're used to that way of thinking. Yes. Cause this was a big, I mean, preaching to the choir here, cause f for me choosing university was just, the most stressful yeah. time, because I don't know, maybe it was like the era that we were brought up in, but huge turning point, you said in in your life, and particularly for mine as well, because you, you essentially were picking a life. Mm. You were choosing, because everyone was like, it's gonna be the best time ever, this'll, you know, and- It put so much pressure it's on. so it. much pressure, because you think, well, if I choose to go there, I'm not gonna, so, you you said that you did fail to get into university. Yeah. So what, I mean, take me through that. Well, what happened was I, I got I got three Bs, which is oh, not wow. bad. It's not bad at all. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad at all. In what, drama, English? Drama, English literature, and media studies. Yeah. So I had three Bs, so I could have got into a university, but like you said, I just didn't know what, what, what I wanted to do. Mm. I thought I wanted to go to university. My mum wasn't keen on me going to university. Oh, really? My father was just obsessed with me moving to London. He says, it doesn't matter if you if you go and study in a, a used auto garage, as long as you're in London, because he, he lives in London and he was just, he wanted me to kind sort of Sort of like the streets Bolton, are paved really. of gold. Yeah, yeah, or yeah he sort of right. had that sort of attitude. He would never have been able to afford me. At that time, his business was really going down. And what was his business, if you don't know? So he was him. involved in um, sort of import-export business, because okay. I won't go into that much. <laughs> but his business was sort of dying, and he would not have been able to support me at all. So it was a good job I didn't really go. He was but, probably hoping, can I shack up with Yeah, you? maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah well, he's, he's here now. <laughs> down to yeah. London anytime soon. <laughs> <a> Ten-year plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we, I, I went to my drama teacher, Dave, who I was quite close <laughs> with, and I said something really rude. Dave, if you're watching this, I said something to you on the phone that was really, really obnoxious and you never spoke to me again after that. And I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what came over me. I don't know why I said it. You probably can't even remember. You probably don't. I said something really bad. It was just very, very obnoxious. Were you just angry that you hadn't got in? I was just really frustrated yeah. with my life and everything at the time. But anyway, I went to see him and he said, Leo, you've got three options. You either go back to college for another year. Mm -hmm. And there was no way in hell I was doing that. Mm -hmm. No way. Uh, go to clearing, so go to a university. Yep. But I had to make the decision on the day, and Oof. I was like, oh. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a big one. That, I, you've seen kids go through that. When those A-level results come through, I can, I can still feel yeah. it that yeah. day. And to be told on that day, you've got to make a decision of where, oh my yeah. God. Where are you no. going, son? Where are you going? Where are you going? <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know if, what I want to study. Never mind. Yeah. So and then the what third, was the option? Yeah, the third. The third option was he says, Leah, I think you're one of the best actors I've ever seen. So I think you should go down the drama school route and go and try and Ooh. take the year out and audition for drama schools. Right, which you hadn't considered before. Which I hadn't really considered before. So then I started. I then took a year out, but then it was a tough year because my dad's business completely dried up. 
So there's no money in the house at all. Oh, so this wasn't a year to go off traveling. This was no, a year to sort of like was, save up. This and... was a year to basically get a job. Yeah. And I remember my my mum being particularly irritated at the fact that I hadn't gone and got a job. And I was, to be fair, quite depressed at the time because all my friends had gone to university. That's tough. I was that's... going to drama. I was going to these auditions. It was like, yeah, but the chances of you getting into drama school are so low. These auditions were costing, you know, the, you know what it's like, 50 yeah. quid, 60 quid a time. And just so young. I mean, I do think sometimes like, I mean, getting into university as well, if you're born um, young in the year and you're going to university or these drama schools at 17. Yeah, can you imagine? I mean, I, I'm i old in my year and I took a gap yeah. year and I'm still like, oh my God, why? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's amazing how much pressure we put on young people really to make those decisions. And they're being told all the time, yeah, this is this is it. You've got to make this big decision. This is the rest of your and life. And you've got to love it. And you've got to love you've it. You've got to love it. Oh my God, like life's for living. And whoa, it's it's like, it's like, you know, when women have been told like, you can do everything and you have to be able to be amazing at absolutely yeah. everything. It's like, yep, I, yeah, I can definitely do that. It's harder than it looks like. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's true either. I think you can spend your twenties just just trying things and working out what you like and what you don't like. And that's fine. You don't need to know when you're 18 years old or whatever. I think we should. I mean, it's a tough one because you do, I suppose you do, if you want to go to university, you do have to make a decision, but it shouldn't be so much pressure on this is what you're going to do. Yeah. And I, I remember, so it's interject, no. but I remember we had a careers advice counsellor come to our high school when we were 14. Mm. And basically they came in and said, what, what do you want to do? Mm. Every single boy said footballer. I mean, we were 14 years old. <laughs> what was yeah. all that I mean, about? I mean, up until about 18, that's probably still what yeah. most boys would do. I still think I could be one. Yeah? Should, yeah, yeah. I, just need the, I just need the trial. I mean, you've done enough different careers. I think <laughs> you've still got a couple back in the pocket. <laughs> um, okay, so gap year, gap year. Yeah. But taking a year out wasn't brilliant. Is wasn't this way, brilliant. Wasn't brilliant, but did you get your first job during this year? Well, that's what happened, yeah. Okay. So my... I remember I signed on on the dole, yeah. which again is depressing. No. It is a bit depressing. Why not? It is a I bit did it depressing. for a few months. Yeah, I know. But it, it just when you're 18 and like as well, I was sort of like a bit, I felt a little bit like the great white hope of the family because I was the bright one. So I was like expected to go to university and get a really good job. That's so interesting because your mum wasn't keen on you going. She was. I think she just didn't like the idea I don't, th looking back, I think she didn't think I was ready and she's probably right. Okay. She was probably right. Saying goodbye to a little boy as well, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's another part of it yeah. as well. Um, I just didn't think she was ready for me to leave home. And I don't think I was ready either, really looking back. Mm. And I remember my nan, I, and my nan's not really this type of person, but she was berating me while I was on the floor shaving my head. Sure. Because I, I couldn't afford to get go to a barber's, right? So I'm on the floor shaving my just head. Just one, what's it called? Like uh, Yeah, like a what, one what or... is it? Uh, skinhead type thing or whatever, oh, wow. whatever it was. And my nan's saying, you got to go out and get, get a job. you got to get a job. It's like a scene from Shameless, you know? And like, where, <laughs> where did this come from? But I then did get a job um, selling sports advertising space. And that... In Bolton? In Manchester. Okay, in oh, Manchester. I, love Manchester. I, had to, I, I I applied for to be a baker. You oh, <laughs> that can be something else you do in the future. Yeah, maybe. Oh, I'd love to bake. I love to bake I'd as well. Love to bake. Well, I just thought it, that you start at three. So my, in my this is my mindset. Let me start at three. Three a.m. as a baker. Oh my god, I thought you were just like right the three year olds. Oh, the line them up, line get them. Up. Up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You start at 3 a.m. Yeah, maybe I don't want to do That's that. That's what it said on the advert. And I was thinking, right, what? Because I've, I've always been a night owl. So I thought, okay, what I'll do is I'll stay up all night, go bake, and then come home and sleep. That was that was literally my, my mindset. But they said no. The baking said no. But the sports marketing people said yes. So then that's when I started my career in sales. Okay. As a sports, and I thought, well, sales is like acting kind of thing, right? So yes. Just turn up. Um, and... To be completely honest with you, when I first started, I was I was useless. I was terrible. I was the worst salesman you've ever seen. They must have seen something in you. Maybe, yeah. Um, I remember. And he brings in baked to good, so he brings yeah. <laughs> he's bringing in all those buns, so we got to keep him in. Um, and I never forget a big turning point for me. We were selling a project in Finland, and we're getting nowhere. People putting the phone down. It was telesales, so it's tough. Mm. 
speaking to managing directors of companies in Finland. Wow. So I call this guy up and bear in mind, I'd had one deal, but they brought in and they, I think they lost money on it. They just brought it in just to cheer me up, right? Which made me actually feel worse because mm -hmm. then I felt like, you know. A pity sale. Yeah, a pity yeah. sale, right? Yeah. So this guy, I did the pitch. And then at the end, you say um, to see if you'd be interested for a, pr a price. You don't say the price, but you said the phone went dead. I put the phone down and everything in my body, in my mind, considering I'd been doing it now for about a month and a half, two months, only had that one sale. I thought everything was telling me, this guy just put the phone down. This guy's not interested, right? And I stared at the phone for 30 seconds and I just, something came over me. I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I picked it up and I called him back and he booked and he did it. And that was the first proper deal. But I always think how many people would just not have rang him back? Because mm. the phone went dead. Mm. It was like he put the phone down. And I'm not standing for this. Yeah. I just, there was something that came over me that moment that I was just like, okay, I'm doing it. And then that's kind of sick kick started and I became actually quite good at the job. Wow. Okay. That. So how long did you do that, that for? Because you then started a little bit later, but your acting career. Yes. So during that time, I had then had a bit of money because I was selling sports advertising space and I was living at home. So mm -hmm. I had a little bit of spare cash. So that's when I started doing auditions and I started training with acting teachers, uh, in particular a guy called Ian Vernon, who is a director, film director, but he's also a screen acting coach as well. And I would say he's probably one of the best in the country or he was back then. Wow. So he was great. And I, I worked with him for about two years and I got to, I think a good level of screen acting ability. So on the side of your normal job? On the side of the normal job, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, because they were evening classes. They were so, evening classes. Okay, hang on. So you're, you, right, so you're working in sports? Marketing, sport, marketing. Selling, sp selling advertising space at sports. Yeah. yeah. Then you're on the side doing your acting training. Yeah. Then you start your first business at the age of 23. Yes. I mean, that's a big <laughs> deal even now. I Considering mean, uh, not that long ago, I was shaving my head without uh, without any money on my nan's floor. That's amazing. Because <laughs> to start a business back then, that's hard. I'm not saying it's easy now, but you have a little bit more at your fingertips to allow you to start businesses online. It's slightly, but wow, that's a lot. Yeah. And what was it? <laughs> It was a sports marketing company. Oh, wow. It was doing exactly what I'd been doing as a salesman. I had a disagreement with the manager. You weren't bringing in enough buns. No, no. Oh, that was, yeah, that was, yeah. yeah I that thought was, so. Uh, You've got to keep yeah. the buns coming. Where are the eclairs? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I had a disagreement with the manager and I just said to him that, you know, there's two things that I would like to have brought in. Mm. And if you don't bring them in, then I'm going to leave. And he didn't, he said no. But looking back now, of course, any manager would say no, because mm. that's, you know, you you give someone an inch, they take a foot kind of thing, right? But just at the time, I just felt like it was the next best thing for me because I really did want to do the acting. And I felt that if I could have my own business, then it would give me the freedom to then go and do acting work whenever I wanted to. However, the business then sort of took on a life of its own and then that kind of took over my life for a, for a few years. And then your dad's 10 year plan comes into action. There because you go. You moved to London. Exactly. The following year. Yes. With the business. With the business. Wow. Okay. So it was all going very well. All going great. It was really good. First year, I think I made, uh, I made a decent amount of money considering my age. Yeah. 23. I remember seeing, I remember thinking, oh, I'm too young, too young, too young. And then I saw a documentary about Theopathetus, who was on Dragon's Den. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I remember the documentary, it was in the living room, came on. Theopathetus started his business at the age of 23. And as soon as I heard that, it took away the excuse. It was mm -hmm. like, well, if Theopathetus mm -hmm. did it, then I'm going to do it. You know, that was literally, literally it. But I mean, that's what we're breaking so many boundaries at the moment, just in, in like modern life now. You know, you see people who are different 
on screen doing things that you didn't think you could do. So it's brilliant, these breaking down of barriers going, yeah, I can do it now because yeah. I can see someone like me or like, you know, that... I think Once Upon a Time was just old white men that did exactly. anything. Exactly. It's so much more uh, represent. I mean, it's a long way to go, but it's so much more representative. Exactly, and I think it, that's the way it should be. It should be equal for every single person, you know? Yeah. Everyone should have a chance. Um, things were going well, you said. Yes. But... But... It took a turn, a real turn for the worse. You... You got scammed and you lost twenty five thousand pounds, which was based on all the money I'd earned. I mean, that's amazing. You earned that much. Yeah, you in saved the first that year. And then, yeah, <gasps> and then I sort of, what I got happened? involved. I can't go into too much detail uh, for legal reasons, but I was involved in a, I, I an investment scam. I invested in something which turned out to not be real. Um, I it was a confidence trickster. Taught me into doing it. Some other people were involved as well which kind of got me involved. And yeah, I lost I lost all the money. I also went into debt as well. And also it meant that I had to take out uh, an office space because as part of the investment, they wanted me to be have a office space. Right. So I was stuck with an office space, which I had to pay for each month. You're plus, in London? In London, plus 25 grand out the, out the window. Um, and it was hard. That was that was difficult. That because you know I I, I trusted the person involved. It really um, makes you just think about humanity. It isn't. It just you just have yeah. no confidence in people when things like that happen. Yeah, Can yeah. you trust it, people? It was, it was really really awful at the time. Oh. And um, he's now in prison. So wow. So he's, uh, that's all I'm going to say on that. But he's okay. now he's now in prison. Uh, it wasn't just me. It was a lot of people that were involved. I didn't get the money didn't back. Didn't get though. it back. No, no, no chance. But he is now in prison, yeah. But so, like a phoenix out of the ashes, rising, rising <laughs> again. I mean, you're still only 24 at this point. You start another business. No, no, no. So that car I carried on with that business. You, ca you managed to carry. Oh I wow! Managed to carry so on with that business, but we it was tight. Okay, it was really tight. This is RSM. So what I, this was rocket science marketing, right? And what because I had this office space, I was like, right. I need to do something with this office space. So then I was like, okay, what I'll do is I'll hire a couple of people and we'll kind of just go for broke. Because I thought to myself, if I hire two people, then we'll get more sales. Yeah. And then that will hopefully offset the the losses that I'd made. Okay. And it did work, to be fair. The first year that we did that, the business did well. It was very tight at times. There were times when I had like no money in the bank to pay people, but we did do it. And then, I then got a little bit, a little bit maybe complacent, a little bit cocky maybe. And then I hired three more people. Confident. Confident. I like it. Now my feeling at the time was, okay, this is how much we've done in terms of sales with myself and two people. So myself and four people will do this. But what happened was the cost of everything just went up. We took out more office space. I had all more, more salaries to pay. And uh, we were we were burning a lot of money, and um, I, I, we spent a, we were insolvent for a, for a good year. I mean, it was amazing actually how I managed to keep that company afloat. And I tell you, when wages are due on Friday, and it's Thursday afternoon, and you haven't got enough money in that oh, account, it's stressful. Right? To this. That, <laughs> oh my god! That puts hairs on your chest, you know. That is, I mean, I'm a freelancer, but that is stressful. Having people on your payroll, I mean. <laughs> There is someone here, I mean, I won't name his name, but he was an investor. Yes. Well, we, we <sighs> needed cash desperately. Okay, tell me more. And I, I, I got a guy lined up and he, he agreed and he kept, kept putting it back, kept putting it back, kept putting it back. He was asking for certain things, which is fair enough, due diligence and everything. And look, I don't, at the end of the day, I understand why he didn't invest and I nothing personal at all. It was just a financial decision. He didn't want to do it. Um, and he, he sort of strung you along a but bit. But he strung yeah. me along a little bit, yeah. And it got to the point, and maybe this is, again, naivety on my side again. You know, I should have been looking for other investors. I should have been looking for other ways. But it came to a point where basically I, I, we, we needed the money. Hmm. I, said, I said to him, look, you either invest today or we close the business. Wow. This is the situation. And I remember I went in in the morning and one of my em employees, George, was there. Who George, I, I was very close with, and he. I said to him, I said I was meeting with him on Monday, the investor, and I said, 
no one come in on Monday. I want to speak to him first and then I'll let you know what happens. Okay, so they kind of knew what was going on. George came in, a bit of moral support, and then I met with, with the investor and he just said, no one in their right mind would invest in this company. And that was a, a real blow, really, because um, basically I had financially not mismanaged the company, but the finances were a lot bleaker than I was letting on, right? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, you live and learn, basically. You live but, and learn. But that's exactly it. You do live and learn. You're still so young. You say that, you, you know, you, you take some of the biggest, best entrepreneurs, what they've been through, the amount of times they've failed, however yeah. you want to say it, but then brought themselves back up. That's, you know, what, what's the saying that, you know, you fail a hundred times and it's that one that business. One time, that's, yeah. This is, I mean, like, honestly, <laughs> you, you have got this, I'm excited for your future because like you said, you've just, yes, they're big lessons, but they're also massive successes. People, you haven't done things by, you know, small amounts. No, yeah, I, I, exactly. I've taken the chance and it's not paid off every time, but still taking a chance, you learn so much and you grow so much yeah, as a person. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You really do. Um, so, I mean, you say like G George, you're very close to, he's one of your employees. The, thing, he... the problem I have with that business, Anna, just to interject, yeah. is I kind of got too close with the employees. Which is George. Which, one of them was George and there are other, other characters as well. And, and we were, it was a wonderful time. Mm because we were like brothers in a way. Yeah. We were so close, but it made it really difficult to make real business decisions. And really I should have let a couple of them go. But that's a, that's a huge S learning curve. I mean, sooner yeah. Sooner than later. And that was then, I, I came back from the meeting with the investor and I sat down and I said, right, do I bring them all in and sack them? <laughs> or do I text them? <laughs> Send them a bun. <laughs> Send them a bun. <laughs> An iced bun. An iced <laughs> Sorry. bun from the baking days. <laughs> um, I decided I'm just going to go through each one. And at the time we had, including part-time people, we had nine. Wow. Yeah. I just went through each one. Oh. Hi, Hannah. I'm sorry the company's uh, closed. I wish you all the best. Bye. I just did that, really. And that was tough. That was tough. That was but hard. you recovered from the bankruptcy of that. Yeah, I did. I, 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 came, I had at one point I had seventy pounds in my account. Oh. So I paid my rent, which was at the time was seven hundred, and that left me. I know. Yeah, I, I was. Yeah, it was cheap, right? No, not cheap. Okay. Where, where were you living? I was living here in in, uh, in in East London. Oh wow! Bills included. Yes. Okay, that's that's much better. I think so. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> um, I paid my rent seventy seven hundred quid. I had seventy quid left, and. I set myself two red lines. I said, I'm not moving back to Bolton. That's not happening. And I'm not working for anyone. There were the two red lines I set. And I said, look, if I'm starving, I will, I will do that. I will stick by those red lines. Oh. And I managed to start this, the new company sponsor wise with that 70 quid <laughs> and then build it all up again. And now we're doing about half a million turnover. So that's not too bad. And this is why Leo does what he does and has a <laughs> website that encourages people to do the same. I mean, yeah. it's absolutely amazing. But it's like this podcast and stuff, it's very motivational, the things you're saying. You I hope so. Write some of these things down on like, affirm you should write an affirmation book. Yeah, I should I should post, Aww. yeah, or, or, or I don't know. You do post to, them. I do post stuff, yeah. I, I, think it's, I think everyone should, people I think need more belief in themselves and, and confidence and self-esteem. And I think people should take risks more. You know, I think what's the worst thing that could possibly happen, happened to me. Mm. I lost everything. Mm. I had to sell my car, my guitars or everything to pay for, for the bankruptcy. And um, I'm still here. <laughs> Bigger and better than ever. Yeah, so, you, so from that point then, obviously you said you started the new business, mm -hmm. but you've also been, I mean, you've really recently thrown yourself into online content, you know, digital creating, you're on all of the platforms now. Yeah. And you're kind of going back to your... Back to my roots. Back to your really. roots, back to your, you know, your initial passion and love, which was, you know, the acting and being in front of the camera, but also kind of like passing on your wisdom to other people as well. So tell me a bit about, you know, the ambitions you had when you were younger and bringing those back. Yeah, well, I did ha I did have an acting career of sorts in my early 20s. Uh, well, I was how in you fit that in? I don't know how I fit in either. <laughs> but I had I was in a few films. Uh, one, Two of them were on Amazon Prime Video, 
which is quite cool, I suppose. I don't think I've... What were these called? Can we watch One of them was called Corruption 2, which is okay. Um, Another one was called Bastion, where I'm in every single scene of the film. But it's not a very good film. So. But Leo's in it. But I'm so, in it. So, you know, uh, go and watch it. Yeah, that <laughs> film, unfortunately, was, was, was not the best. <laughs> but I'm in every single scene. So if you do want to see my acting ability, I've been told I am a mixture of Matt LeBlanc and Johnny Depp acting ability. So okay, I'll take, no. I'll take that. <laughs> I think I'll you take should that. take that. However, one review said um, I was very, I was wooden. So, no, he said something more witty than that. He said, I was so wooden that you couldn't tell me apart from trees in a forest or something. Something w- like that. Witty? I don't know. But I take the Matt LeBlanc and... and um, hey, Johnny there's Depp. always... Get, no, not everyone is going to... And that's another thing. Not everyone is going to like you and that's okay. That is just normal and being on this is but this isn't uh, you know at you i'm talking about just generally with people and you know particularly i'm sure you sure you know this from being online the you know you're gonna get your your differences of opinion and haters or trolls or whatever you want to call them and you know sometimes it it can sometimes hurt a little bit um but you just gotta just try and try and fight through it you know and Mm -hmm. i do sometimes get I can get quite down sometimes. Uh, that I don't really suffer so much with anxiety, much more depression. And sometimes I do have quite dark days. Mm. And But you have to rise through it. You have to find a way of just gritting your teeth and, and rising rising through it. Well, how do you? And I'm sure you know people are going to find this very helpful if they do suffer the same. What, what do you do well, if you are having a very dark day? It's usually something that I, I, it's kind of tied in with my sort of self-worth, actually. So I kind of feel like oh, I'm, I'm not what it's me existing on this planet is is not, you know I should have been, I should have died at war years ago or something like that. You know that's the sort of mindset I end up falling into, and I think you just got to just be kind to yourself, really. Mm-hmm. Be really kind to yourself and try to take some time away from stressful things and try to relax and entertain yourself and put your mind off it. And, you know, get get to grips with what makes you happy or gives you energy. You know, for me, I think confidence and energy are very linked. Mm. You know, if you have lots of energy, then you feel a lot more confident. Well, I certainly, that's how I feel. And less energy, you sort of fall into that sort of depressive cycle. Um, so what for you, what is a trigger for you that makes you feel down? And what are some of your favorite ways that bring you back up? question um i think sometimes it can be something very 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 small and in, innocuous you know some maybe a comment someone someone says uh particularly if it's if it's coming from from a girl actually to be mm. honest that does hurt a lot more mm. i th- i kind of feel like men can say anything they want to me and it, it would come, it's like water off a duck's back but when when a woman says it to me it kind of feels a bit more personal mm. maybe that has something to do with 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 my mother i don't mm. know in terms of getting back on my feet i think exercise is fantastic cardio uh you know weights yoga is fantastic i think i do also see a therapist as well mm-hmm. once every two weeks which has been fantastic mm. really good uh, very, very insightful, mm. you know, finding out about yourself. Yeah. You know, that can that can help a lot as well. You know, just taking that time to look at, look at yourself in the mirror, metaphorically speaking, mm-hmm. and say, why am I like this? Why do I feel this way? Why do I get so upset when someone says that? Why am I so happy when someone says that? Mm. You know? And I think deep down at heart, I am an entertainer, mm. really, deep down. And sometimes when I'm not as entertaining, I kind of feel the booze, I feel the laughter a lot, but I also feel the booze as well. So like sometimes when when people, you know, dislike me or whatever, I do sometimes feel Take it to heart. A little bit. I take things personally, yeah. yeah. When really I shouldn't. You know, I, I'm a kind of uh, sometimes yeah, I do kind of take things a little bit too personally sometimes. Like if someone I've got a lot better. Yeah. Like so say if someone didn't meet me for whatever reason, I'd say oh, it's because they don't like me or it's because whatever they're being disrespectful but in reality it's it's probably something it's their problem you know i'm just so, for example yeah i th- i think i have to agree in that 
I I probably I, mean, I to be fair I think a lot of people take things personally I think you have to have a really thick skin not to yeah. you know be affected by things like that but what I'm learning as I'm getting older is that everyone's got their own stuff going on and like you said if for whatever reason because you know if, if someone doesn't text me off I'm like oh maybe because I've done that or oh I, I bet and I I always go back on it's my fault yeah. um, whereas the reality is probably you are they are not yeah. thinking about you in the nicest way on. possible isn't yeah. they've got their own stuff going on so that's it so you found that therapy has been a big help for you oh yeah, mass talk, yeah. massively yeah. having mean, an outside opinion talk to you outside about. opinion i think most the biggest thing i've taken away from it for me personally is just understanding oneself you know uh, before i'd never really thought of myself like that and in fact I kind of, the reason why I'd kind of done so many things a little bit was tied to self-hatred because I was sort of saying, right, I need to be better. I need to be a better person because that the person I was born to be. What sort is, of like reinventing not, yourself kind a little of, bit. Yeah, when, mm. but you can reinvent yourself in a kind way. Mm -hmm. And then you can also reinvent yourself by, you know, in a, in a really hostile attacking way. And I was, you got to make sure I think in life Self-improvement, I think, is a wonderful thing. But you do it because you love yourself, not because you hate yourself. And that's the key. Yeah. So talking about, um, you know, your friendships, your family, relationships, sort of where are you in, in that? Because obviously when it comes to having your own business, content creating, acting, unfortunately, the reality is sacrifices yeah. are inevitable. Yeah. So how how, do, how does that work? Well, that also a little bit ties in with the web series a little bit, which is about relationships. Wh which we will come on to a little we'll bit later. shortly. <laughs> um, yeah, relationships have taken a little bit of a back seat, mm -hmm. really. You know, because I, I, I've done so much and I'm working so much all the time. Yeah. You know, relationships have taken a bit of a back seat. I've not, I don't have a family. I'm a single man. I do live with my father which is kind of like a family unit. It's a bit more like Steptoe and Son at times, <laughs> if, if, if anyone knows that reference. And uh, yeah, I, I've sacrificed that a little bit, but there's still time. You know, I'm lucky that I'm a man and I have that, mm. you know, I can be 50 years old and start a family, you know? 80 years old if you're Al Pacino. <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you... Um... Do you speak to your sister? Yeah, I do. We have we have a very we're very different people. Oh, see, that's interesting. I was I was going to ask, are you quite similar? From because maybe there's are there are similarities in the way that you were brought up, and you can kind of go, ah, that's why we are. But it, she's very different, is she? She's it's like a di yeah. You wouldn't mm. you wouldn't think that we we're brothers. We do look a bit similar, mm -hmm. but otherwise you wouldn't think that we we're brother and sister. Very very different. But we have this bond between us which is very, very strong. I think stronger, I mean, I, 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 I think, yeah, I think stronger than most other brothers and sisters, but I, I don't know. If, from what you went through from, together. Yeah, from what we went through together, we kind of felt, yeah, I think that we, we, we have that from, 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 from that time. Mm -hmm. What would you say to anyone watching this that is, you know, thinking, oh, this guy, he's like, you know, he's gone out and followed his dreams, he's gone, Back again to, you know, early childhood um, ambitions. He's been knocked down and he's picked himself up again. And like actually Chumbawamba, thrived. <laughs> what my friend says that's, that should be my anthem. <laughs> hey, I mean, like, you're in control of this podcast. Let's, let's get that on in the background yeah, right now. let's get the license for it. <laughs> what would you say to anyone watching this? You know, like, an affirmation, something motivational that, you know, people can look to you and think, well, wow, okay, I mean, if... I'm going to go for it. I would say that you've got to follow your dream. And your dream is just behind a door. Now, I don't know where that door is for you. It could be a mile away. It could be 10 miles away. It could be a big bulky door. It could be a tiny door that you have to squeeze through. I don't know what the situation is with that. But it is on the other side of that door. And you owe it to yourself. You only live once. It's not a rehearsal. Mm. And you got to go find it and break it down because what you want is on the other side of that door mm -hmm. and you've got to believe in yourself and do it. That's, that's what I would say to anybody that's watching and, and feeling that way. There you go. And follow this man. <laughs> follow me. Follow. Yeah. Yeah. Do you read any motivational books? Yeah, I do. I, I do. I like, um, there's a few people, 
that I I watch more than I read. Mm. If I'm if I'm honest with you, um, as a content creator, that's not hard. Yeah, to we <laughs> yeah, we fall into the YouTube rabbit hole. Um, I do like uh, I do like Simon Sinek. I think he's great. Find your why. Um, I really love Stephen Bartlett. The stuff that, and Diary of the CEO. I think he's very inspiring, and the guests that he ha has on are very inspiring. I think everything he does from a marketing perspective is is spot on. I really like as well. He's very controversial, but I like Dan Pena. Mm. Um, he's very hardcore though. He's not for the faint-hearted. He's very, you know, super. Motivational. Yeah, he, he scares most people, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, you're getting a holistic approach here, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, it is nice. You're getting, yeah. <laughs> ticking all the boxes. Um, and in terms of like, I, I, in terms of people that have inspired me so far in since I've been going into the social media stuff and more into sort of internet world, I really like um, Simon Jordan. I think he's brilliant. Uh, he's a presenter on TalkSport. He had his own business as well. I think he's he's fantastic in terms of being a presenter and an orator. He's got his own podcast series now. And um, yeah, I think Casey Neistat with, with his vlogs, he's, he's great. Um, so talking about social media then and your online presence, yes. I know, you, you, you know you've you always had one of some sort, but like I said, recently you've really given this a massive push. And is that to push the business or is that because you're just finding a real love for it? And Because you're... You're on all of the platforms. That's hard work. Yeah, it's, it's it, being on social media. It's a job in it's itself. It's a job in itself. Yeah. yeah, I'm just trying to kind of build up some kind of audience, really. Mm. So the and I a community and a it's community, quality, isn't it? Over quantity, you want people who really, you know, like want to watch you for you. And yeah, and I'm hoping that will sort of my dream now at this stage is to do scripted content. You know, and I want to try and get an audience. So then when I do make scripted content, like I'm working on a web series at the moment, people will watch it and they'll feel like they will they want to watch it because yeah. they know my content already. Yeah. So it's really more more of that, really, mm -hmm. just to try and use it as this kind of marketing tool to get people interested in, in the content I'm producing in the future. I mean, hey, look, it looks like you're enjoying yourself, which is the main thing. I was having a look at <laughs> Maybe videos. a bit too much I sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I got stuck down into a rabbit war and of watching them all because that is, it's very entertaining. You are you. You're exactly the same as you are on your videos. And you it's very difficult to have a facade when you're doing social media because you can see. And yeah. it's, it's so lovely. Well, one stuff. of the guys actually uh, that really inspired me. So just to, just to quickly say, uh, for two years ago, I had no social media. Mm. During the lockdown and during the time I was building up the second business, I was completely focused on that. And I, I put that time, basically caffeine, exercise, caffeine, caffeine exercise, exercise and Duran Duran. Ooh, hoo -hoo. Yeah. What a what a mixture. So yoga, Duran Duran with a little cheeky sip with a of, with a coffee. Or I would sort of smash a coffee, go running, listening to the reflex. Or I think I think you need to do a video <laughs> just on this and be like Leo's morning routine. Yeah. <laughs> but the point really I'm making there is music. You know that was just something because mm. yeah, I was quite low. I was skint. I was really skint. And I just lost everything. And I was trying to build it all back up again. And that's why I put social media to one side. But anyway, I've been back on social media and really pushing everything for like the last maybe year or so. And loving it. And loving it. And one of the guys that really inspired me um, is a comedian actually called David McSavage. And he puts stuff up, which is really funny, but it's mm. also really real. Mm. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't sugarcoat anything. And that a little bit inspired me as well to just put stuff out there that no holes barred kind of thing. It's brave, man. It's really <laughs> brave. No, but the thing is you, you've kind of got to make that decision mm. when you go on social media like you're doing. You've got to go for it. You've got to show, not have to, but it's if you're going to show yourself, you need to show every side of it. And and people love that, though. You know, people want to kind of see all the gory details. Yeah, they do. And, you know, like you having maybe a lower day, but then, you know, having a higher day and seeing you. Yeah. And you can kind of like live your life vicariously through some people. Why not? I like if it brings you joy, which hopefully is what you're doing to your audience. I, then. I, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy it. Aww. I'm a little bit, a little bit of an attention whore, to be honest with you. <laughs> if I'm really honest, I do love it. Um, even though, I, you know, at the moment, my my audience is is pretty small, to be to be completely frank. But 
they're quite interested in what I'm doing. So give it time. As I mean, a percentage, a I think they're quite they're quite um, involved. Yeah. There you go. Give this a like. Give us a like, subscribe and follow. <laughs> uh, well, exciting things for the future. Yes. You've got your new web series, Leo's Love Life. Yeah, you heard it there first. You heard Can't it wait. First. Most people think it's just going to be me shagging a lot of women, but it's not. I mean, that will bring in a certain that audience. Will, yeah, I could which, put it on know, Pornhub rather than yeah, YouTube. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this is... Now, okay... This isn't necessarily you, you. This is a fictional representation of you. That's You're right. I've looking taken for love. I've taken a bit of inspiration. It's it's a comedy. It's a comedy first. So if anyone's sort of thinking, oh, it's too going to be too romantic and too soft, it is a comedy first. Mm -hmm. uh, it's based on a number of things that I've been writing over the past few years. This is the angle I'm going down. So it's Leo's love life, and it's basically just a story of. A guy in his early 30s, a group of people in their 30s, really, mm -hmm. that are just trying to find love in, mm -hmm. in the big city and all the things that can go wrong in, in doing so. I mean, brilliant. I mean, London, presumably. London, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look, look, London is finding love in London. Finding it's, love in London is very tough. I'm yeah. excited to see if Leo does. Well, yeah, well, well I'm excited as well to see what happens. Uh, but yeah, let's see what happens. <laughs> this comes out in October. It will be out either October or November time. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure yet, but I think probably when I put this out, it will be out. Okay. So you can just go on my channel. You're probably watching this now on my channel. Go on my channel and you will find it, Leo's Love Life, and little clips as well from it as well. Very excited. And where else can people find you? They can find me on TikTok. They can find me on Instagram. Um, they can find me on YouTube. And that's it really, I think. Facebook, but I never use it. Facebook, if website. To... Well, yeah, my, this man, my yeah. website as well, which is leotgenati.com. Um, and yeah, I'm also doing a course, camera charisma course, which now is feeling more aimed at actors, actually. Okay. So actors, if they're looking for maybe a bit of advice, depends where they are in their career. Um, I can just offer an opinion as a sort of a not as an agent or a manager, but just as a sort of yeah. outside presence, just saying, okay, this is what I think you should do. This is what I think you should improve in terms of showreel or photos or which agent to go with. So that's that sort of thing as well. And helping actors get on the way in the, in the I feel industry. like you could be a career coach as well, Leo. Just Maybe saying. a business as well, maybe as well. I mean, I kind of feel like, I don't know, I never really, ever really, I don't know, I, I've never really felt qualified enough to, to talk about being a business, I mean, I have, I am a business owner. I've had a, a, my own business for however many years, eight years or whatever. But I still feel like I'm learning all the time, you know. But if if anyone is interested in that, if anyone wants to start their own business, I'm very passionate about that as well. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. if people want to start their own business and they need a bit of advice or some guidance, then hook me up. You know, get in touch, and I'll be able to help you as much as I possibly can. Sound like a very busy man. What is a I don't think that I don't think there is a typical day for you, but <laughs> give us a bit of a rundown of a typical day in the life of Leo. What time do you get up? What do you have for breakfast? And then tell me the rest. Well, I'd love to say I got up at half four in the morning, and I'm one of those no, guys. No, no, no. But no. I'm really Five not. Club is like I can't. No, nah, I'm not. I, I'm much more. I get up usually. The perfect day for me would be getting up about eight. Okay. Yoga, meditation, Duran Duran. <laughs> <laughs> Hungry like the wolf. Yeah. And then I usually have my first meeting at nine o'clock. Okay. And then I work from my office nine till five, six o'clock. At home. At home. And then I do also do other little bits and pieces. Sometimes I work a bit late, but I'm not, I'm not that, I don't think I'm that abnormal i think most people do that right so, so meetings take up the most most of your day then at the moment it's mainly meetings okay. yeah and and mainly i have a guy that works for me at sponsor wise who's responsible for the sales and i'm more sort of organizing the business and then with xanadu and the production stuff mm -hmm. like right now we're in pre-production of the web series so yesterday i had meetings with all the actors all the crew one by one one-to-one -one meetings uh which was actually really good fun actually so this is why you haven't got any uh this is why I haven't got any time to go out of an evening and meet a certain someone. Busy man. <laughs> Busy man. Well, not for want of trying. <laughs> All right. Very quickly, let's finish up with talking about the future. So what does the rest of the year going into next year hold for Leo? 
Well, I'd like to get this scripted piece done and online and released and hopefully people find it funny and people enjoy it. Moving forward in the future, I want to do more scripted stuff. I do feel like I want to push more into comedy. I'd like to do that. I might even start doing a little bit of stand-up maybe. Let's see what happens there. And um, yeah, more scripted stuff, build up the businesses. Sponsor-wise is going well. Um, good partnership with the EHF. Shout out to the EHF. <laughs> And um, that's going well. And with the with the with Xanadu Media and the production stuff, I want to produce more things and build up a real big media company, and also hopefully get my face in front of the camera a, a bit as well. So that's kind we need of, to see this more on the camera. We need to see this the more on, on, the, on the big 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 screen. So yeah, that's it really. And just just trying to build up the companies and build up my profile, so to speak, and make some great content. I do love, really love creating content um like this podcasts i might do another podcast series i think this will probably be the last episode of lift yeah oh. this will be the last there you go episode. i thought well thank you so much for having me on and interviewing you for living in the hyphen podcast it's been an absolute joy getting to know more about you um and i think your audience is absolutely going to love this and hopefully get lots more people following you and it sounds like a very very exciting couple of years for you yeah, well, let's see what happens, eh? Hopefully. Amazing. Yeah, let's see what happens. Thanks so thanks again, Anna. This has really been really great. Thank you. Absolutely. You're brilliant. Mm -hmm.